at the Fort Monroe Theater in Hampton. The topic is Religion, Race, Relationships, and Hopes for Redemption. The town hall is free and it's open to everyone, but we do need you to register. So please go to whro.org slash talkaboutrace to sign up. So that is Tuesday, April the 5th from 6 until 8 p.m. It is the last of our series of town hall meetings and our Race Let's Talk About It initiative. We sure hope that we will see you there. So there's lots to talk about with our roundtable today, so let's get started. Roger Chesley is a columnist with the Virginian Pilot, and you can read his columns every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Hey, Roger. Hello, Barbara. How are you doing, I'm doing this? great. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you for being here. Carol Pretlow is a political science professor at Norfolk State University. Hi, Carol. Hi, Barbara. How's spring break? Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Thomas is our community activist, just flew in from D.C. Hey, Bill. Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Everything going well? Life is beautiful. Life is beautiful. That's wonderful. And Will Levis is a journalist, author, and talk show host, and you can hear his show every Wednesday on Hampton University Radio, WHOV FM. He's joining us by phone right now and hopefully momentarily in the studio, right, Will? Yes, in about one minute, I'll be glad <laughs> to see your wonderful face. <laughs> It is a technology fabulous. We really appreciate that. All right, let's get started, guys. Um, Oh, by the way, we are going to have a very civil conversation and be polite to each other, even though we're talking about some issues that cause people... To become excited. You mean there'll be no discussion of hand size today? <laughs> there will be no discussion. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Ben Carson this morning endorsed Donald Trump for president. He's the latest of several endorsements of Trump by African Americans, including the brother of slain civil rights activist Mega Evers. Let's take a listen. Your support of him is raising a lot of eyebrows. Why did you decide to endorse Donald Trump? The main reason why I like him, he shoots from the hip. And he doesn't have written speeches and all that kind of stuff. He's just a man who's not, and he's about to be in there. He didn't get there by sitting around waiting on welfare on the corner every month. Given the things that Donald Trump has said, he's wavered on denouncing the KKK and, and, and David Duke. He has offended some people with his use of the phrase, the blacks. Does that concern you at all? Not really, because let me tell you, most whites in this country have a problem with black folk, and you know that. But he'd happen to be the one to stand and speak up for it. We blacks have a problem with ourselves some. In Chicago last year, over 500 blacks were killed by blacks. So, you know, when you start talking about who cares about who, it doesn't matter. He's going to be president of the United States, and I hope that we can get to use him as the president of all of us and not black folks or white folks. used to vote Democrat. What was it about Trump that lured you in? Were you fans of his before he started running? When he announced he was running for president, mm-hmm. I was watching CNN. I mm-hmm. called Silk. I said, Silk, cut the TV on, girl. Donald is announcing he's running for president. And I did. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And she called me back halfway through. She said, girl, this is going to be our next president. Mm-hmm. And it's been on ever since. I love everything that he's talking about. And I am tired of voting for the same system that keeps handing us the crumbs. Right. Baby, it's time for a slice of the cake. And bring in Donald Trump that have the ingredients to make the cake. And then he'll show us how to make the cake and we can sit down and have a slice of it. Yeah. Wait, so there's yes. no way you guys are like average voters. You guys you guys work for Trump or you work for the campaign? We do not work, work for Trump. Trump. Okay. We do mm-hmm. not work for the campaign. We no. are truly Trump supporters. We right. support him. Yeah. Everything that he say we love. Yeah. We are voting for him, baby. That's yeah. what we're going to be doing. Okay, that was Charles Evers, the first uh, soundbite we heard, and then Silk and Diamond who have been going around the country in support of Donald Trump. Now, juxtapose that against the um, yesterday or earlier this week, an African-American protester at a Trump rally who was sucker punched, quote unquote, by a white Trump supporter. There's no need to put quotes around that. He was (laughs) was. sucker punched. (laughs) And and the protester was arrested. Now, granted, the supporter was arrested the next day. But, Roger, your reaction to both of these? Well, first of all, you're always going to have at least some black support 
four Republican presidential candidates. And I think it would probably be more if there was more that the Republican Party, uh, the titular head of the Republican Party in terms of the nominee, was actually offering to a, a broad swath of, of African-American voters. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to double check. So, so before I came here, I looked at factcheck.org. Uh, the latest polls among African-Americans show that between 4 to 12 percent are likely to vote for Trump if he he's presumably going to be the uh, GOP nominee. So so there's that. But that's right in line with most presidential elections in this country. It's not a huge difference. You saw uh, an outsized uh, number of African-Americans voting for uh, Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. So that might skew those latest elections. But but historically, that's right around where we'd be. So you're going to have some African-Americans who are going to back them. The overwhelming majority aren't. They're going to go for the Democrats as they have in past years. Mm-hmm. Bill, uh, the uh, the Trump situation in, in 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 my in my face of looking at things is very simple. It's not Trump. People are just tired of the establishment, both Democrats and Republicans. After 50 years, nothing have changed. Are in fact, in the last 12 years, African American communities have suffered horribly: high unemployment non-support of historically black colleges and universities, no jobs, jobs are going other places. So I think people are just tired of both Democrats and Republicans not listening. And uh, I think when you have a primary in a state that has open voting, uh, Trump went with bigger margins because Democrats are crossing over. But what, but what has Trump said that would make African Americans in particular feel that he would support the kinds of things that you talked about in terms of making a difference. Trump is a businessman. And and in my judgment, I would rather deal with a businessman than these politicians that just constantly deceive us. I'm just getting back from the Virginia General Assembly, and we had asked for money to help save black lives. Instead of giving us money, they cut us. Uh, instead of having a black judge on the Supreme Court, they got a white judge from someplace in southwest Virginia. I mean... Democrats and Republicans are not listening. Uh, I think Governor uh, McAuliffe is a good, decent man, and uh, he's a businessman. And but he he thrived on black votes. He only got 36 to 37 percent of the white votes. But the reciprocity in terms of money coming to help save Portsmouth and get rid of those tolls altogether, which is driving their plight, are are trying to cancer is an epidemic in Virginia for everybody, for the African American community. Black men like us here are, have 70 percent chance of dying from cancer than a white man. Mm-hmm. Women, black women. I mean, I'm just telling you. And the goal. But again, back to my question: told, What is Trump saying? He's a businessman. He, people think he's that saying he's, he's going to do something that. different. It's not Trump. It's just not the it's same just old doing thing. Doing something different. Yes, Roger. It, it, it's amazing to me this this love for uh, this quasi politician who is among the one percent who had many advantages uh, before in his upbringing and in his life and who has been shown to, to do, the, he'll say anything off the top of his head without a whole lot of, of uh, you know, programs or policies that, are, that will back up, that he'll, he'll do what he says to do. You know, it's a lot different being a businessman where you can pick and choose those things that you want to deal with, as opposed to being the president, being a governor, where you're going to have to deal with situations that often don't necessarily have a good uh, choice to it. Now, if you're a businessman, you can walk away. As president, as governor, as politicians, you can't do that. Uh, You know, a lot of things that government deals with are those things that nobody else wants to. Um, you know, look at the situation that we're dealing with in Flint right now with the whole issue in Flint, Michigan, with the whole, you know, situation with water. Businessman would turn his back on that because there's there's no good there's outcome no for that. No, but, no you know, ROI. <laughs> you have to deal with that if you're the governor. You have to deal with that as a president. You're going to have all sorts of situations that you can't just uh, bluster your way through. 
And to the the fact that this man has never held political office, it, it just astounds me that he has gained so much uh, support from people. That's Carol, as a political <laughs> scientist, what, what do you see going on? Well, I see the yeah. same thing that Roger sees, and in addition to that, that he would have to deal with the legislature, and that would be the, the assumption, I guess, on his part, is that Republicans will remain in control of both houses. That's debatable, because if they don't remain in control of both houses, that even if he is the president, they can act as a check on him. The other thing that bothers me is that when you ask him specifics, how is this going to be done, in what ways, he spins that usual talking points that he uses, and he doesn't come up with specifics. So I think I'm not... Uh, criticizing the people who do want to support him, but I think they need to ask for specifics. Will Mega Evers' brother is <laughs> supporting Donald Trump? What do you think Mega Evers will be saying right about now? <laughs> what Mega Evers would be saying? Uh, I don't know. I, I I tend to agree with um, Bill on this and a lot of the other uh, political scientists who have been looking at this and analyzing it and saying that in a lot of ways it's an extension of the Great Depression, which happened under a establishment Republican administration. You had the Tea Party movement that came out of that in response to that. And on the other side, you have the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. That's who Bernie Sanders is talking to. Trump is talking to the Tea Party movement. Both sides actually have very similar concerns, very similar issues. And so this is really an outgrowth of it. You look at someone like Rubio and Cruz, came out of the Tea Party movement. Now they're looked upon as established. <laughs> people see that, and they see these pe- these two in particular, we put them in there to actually make a difference. This is what mm-hmm. was seen on the right. They haven't made a difference. Now they're looked upon as establishment. So what does that message say? It says that you keep voting for these uh, politicians, as Bill is just saying, you're not going to get anything different. And so now Democrats have a big problem on their hands. The candidate that they're putting forth is consummate politician going back, way back, back into time. So you want to go back to the future is the message that is coming from the Republicans on the other side. They have a big problem with Hillary Clinton, who's a flawed candidate, right? And, yes, it's an opportunity to put the first woman uh, make the first woman president. But at the same time, it's curious that a lot of women are also going for Bernie Sanders. Why? They're saying, we have confidence there's going to be a woman president at some point. But is Hillary Clinton the one? Were you all surprised at the um, Michigan turnout, speaking of the Democrats, uh, Bill? No, nope. no, I, I, I'm not. I, and <laughs> Will and I are going to be in agreement on this. It's on both sides. After 50 years, and just specifically to the black community, what has changed? Democrats are Republicans. They make promises. They don't listen. And it extends right down there in Richmond. Our politicians will come back to Hampton Roads with no fundable programs for our institutions. None. Zero. Not taking care of the problem of that toll in Portsmouth. Not taking care of health care where Portsmouth leads the Commonwealth in, in cancer death and all other kinds so of disparities. So is, is your point then that whatever happens on the national level is is going to trickle down or is already it's trickling down, down in terms People of what's going on here in Virginia? People are sick and tired of it. And it's not, in my judgment, D's and R's anymore. Nothing. My children, I hate to make it personally, can't find a job in Virginia. They had to go to Ohio, Arizona, and Baltimore, which my son is a lawyer there. He's doing good. But I'm just saying there's nothing going on here. People are sick and tired. And if I didn't vote for Trump, I'd probably vote for Bernie Sanders. Mm. I, I, I do find it interesting that, uh, you know, there seems to be this idea that one senator or one congressman is going to make a huge amount of difference. It doesn't work that way. And you know that you have to uh, generate enough uh, co-sponsors or supporters for legislation to get through. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yes, you can send a couple of senators to to Congress, you can you can send them in, but they to to make any substance, substantive change, you have to get enough support from others. And if you are so hard in, in your positions, and if you are being told by constituents, compromise 
is verboten, compromise is terrible, then, you know, surely that's going to lead to the gridlock that we see. Mm -hmm. And even if you have, you know, how things have to get done in the Senate, you usually have to get 60 uh, votes to go forward. As long as the opposition party has at least 40 to 45 members, they can, you know, they can mess that up if they think there's something that's not in their interest, in their constituents' interest. So the, to, to think that there's going to be, uh, it, and there's sort of a, a reason for that, so that there are checks and balances kind of built into the system. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't know that if you send different people, that's necessarily going to change the, uh, the dynamics of well, that. Well, Roger, in the but, but how does that happen? That happens because of individuals, leaders can come, shake hands, influence, move people to action. FDR, President Lincoln, um, um, LBJ, okay? So you need an individual who can generate that kind of goodwill, who can go and make deals and make relationships and get people to move and understand where this thing is going. This is how you have, you, this is how you come and you have a Margaret Thatcher. This is how you have a Martin Luther King, you know? Mm -hmm. This is how you have a Fred Hampton. You know, to go down a lower level in the community, you have individuals who are able to bring people together. Fred Hampton was making alliances <laughs> with whites, hillbillies, and making alliances and saying, this is what we have in common. And this is the same kind of spirit that is regenerating again. And That's you think hot. that Trump can be the, the conciliatory This is what he's saying. We he's don't saying. know that, but this is what he's saying, okay. and this is what the others are failing to do. Let me tell you something I saw in a debate yesterday that, because I've already said, Trump is a brilliant marketer. Mm -hmm. and he's a smart man. He <laughs> couldn't have achieved the things he achieved if not. Mm -hmm. He did something in that debate when they asked about Social Security. Absolutely. He sat mm -hmm. right there and he said, <laughs> I'm not doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. He was talking directly. Now, if you're a Florida, you're in Florida. <laughs> we getting ready to come to Florida. Mm -hmm. Six million. Exactly. You're, talking, you're in Florida. Yeah. Are you in your 70s. And you hearing that, and then you hearing this young, the young whippersnapper Talking saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to yeah. do anything to hurt my mother, <laughs> yeah. but we've got to do something it's, it's, because it's not going to be solving. Then you hear the other young whippersnapper, he's 40, looking spry, saying a similar thing. And then you turn to this other guy who's a billionaire, who's around your age, and saying, essentially, I don't care what Congress, what the know-nothing, do-nothing Congress does. Ain't when it comes on my desk, yeah. I'm not doing anything with it. Now, you tell me. You a senior citizen in Florida. Who are you going to vote for, Bill? And and I think the sentiment comes in the same way with Bernie Sanders, who I would never even think of even mentioning his name. But they're trying to say they're going to take the power and the funding away from Washington. Mm -hmm. They're going to take it away from the Wall Street people. They're going to take it away, these glad handers that but are all. A, don't you still have the same issue on, on the Bernie Sanders side when people ask him, how are you going to pay for this? Uh, I mean, I think they saying, like the ideas. But, but he is not saying anything different than what is actually happening. Okay. Because nothing is happening. And all these people with all these elegant floor speeches and all these element pro uh, proclamations and things, black community is, I don't know, what, a 40 or 50% poor with average assets? I mean, we're going down. Okay. So what difference does it make what these liars are telling us? <laughs> so we're doomed. <laughs> Let's see what Courtney from Norfolk has to say. Hi, Courtney. Don't you're in the air. Hi, Barbara. How are you guys today? Okay. How are hey. you? Good. Um, I'm actually being buzzed in at a perfect time because my question centers around, um, and full disclosure, I'm strongly leaning Bernie Sanders at this point in the mm -hmm. election cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I go through this uh, moral struggle sometimes where I, I see and understand and um, absorb the talking points around Trump, meaning he has all these, uh, I mean, great I don't mean great as in good, but he has all these grandiose ideologies, and we ask him for specifics, how are you going to do this, and he spins. Um, how do you guys or do you guys not see that translating over to what Bernie says and, and how he's going to get things done? Because I I don't like to feel hypocritical, but I can't help but notice the media headlines, and I'm trying to understand why people say that they're similar. Anybody who wants to take that well, I, well, I, I think, go ahead. Go I think ahead, both of them, uh, they, they do have a, they appeal in a populist way uh, to a lot of folks, and they do speak, at least in their rhetoric, uh, you know, aiming at those folks 
who have been uh, left behind, who it taking longer to get back on track after the Great Recession. And, and so I think that there's part of that. The problem I have with it is, one, has never been in politics in terms of actually holding elective office, and the other one has great plans, but he hasn't shown that, okay, well, what have you done while you've been in Congress? Mm -hmm. You don't really have a, a record of accomplishment to show for. So if that's the case, you know, saying it is one thing. Actually getting things done is something else. And and we're always taught as journalists, yeah, listen to what they say, but what they but actually do. Right. Watch what they do. But, uh, go ahead, Will, and then I'm going to come to Carol. I was going to say, uh -huh. but what is different now is all of these other flawed candidates, mm -hmm. right, who with the, except, with the exception, uh, exception of Kasich, who just doesn't generate that kind of energy. Low energy. Right, low energy. <laughs> but when you listen to what he's saying and you know his experience, you're yeah. saying this is the best, best you can do. qualified Absolutely. guy. Absolutely, low energy. Well, but, but so what's happening is, to, to, mm -hmm. to Roger's point, is that you can say the same about Rubio. You can say the same, even worse <laughs> about all these other flawed candidates yeah. that are there. And then you got Hillary Clinton. Again, totally well qualified, fine. but significantly flawed. And people keep seeing her and keep seeing her husband and seeing the flaws with all of that and saying, do we want to go back to the future, especially coming out of Obama and all this going forward? Do we want to go back? It's, it's Carol, do you think that's lane. the reason why particularly women – are not following um, Hillary in the way that people assumed mm -hmm. was going to happen in the I think that's part of the reason. And the other part of the reason is, unfortunately, Hillary has a reputation of being less than direct and less than honest. Well, and they the see her as... What's the word for that? <laughs> <laughs> as, a liar. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I won't no, go there. Right. But she is um, I... not to be relied on. And even the fact that when you look at the immigration <laughs> policy, okay, she loves Obama. Yeah, we're yeah. together. And then this morning in the Washington Post, there's an article about her saying, well, I'm going to change and swift. We we don't know how to depend on her. We don't know how to rely. I don't like any of those people. I'm sorry. It, it's, <laughs> It's just during the Clinton administration that the vote people from Haiti. I mean, you, you, it's, it's just the, pr the problem that I, I see where people are fed up and they're coming together looking for that leader that Will is so significantly pointing out is that nothing is happening. We're worse off. When we came out of school, I know there were three or four jobs that we could have gotten, three or four. People are coming out of the school, graduating at the top of their class. They can't find a job, period. And, you th and, and your thought is that one of these candidates <laughs> is going to be able to make that happen. They're going to keep making the point. I don't think Trump or Sanders have to do anything else other than keep making the point. Wall Street, 1% of America's population owns, what, 95 or 96% mm -hmm. of the 96%. wealth. And our people down here, you're talking about lead and poisoning in Flint. There's lead flying all over Norfolk this, today. Well, for, we'll talk about and that I'm in just a saying minute. That, but, but see, nobody wants to deal with the issue. And the problem is people don't have any money, no <laughs> jobs, and no hope. Ahead, but but ahead, see, what I, what I fail to understand and, and what I, I'm concerned about is there doesn't seem to be – a knowledge of history and a knowledge of the uh, global economy that's going on now. You put a different person into the White House, that doesn't, that's not going to change some fundamental things that have happened in the U.S. where so many manufacturing jobs have left, okay. so many uh, auto-making uh, jobs have um, left. Yeah. And so you had so many people in past years, and living in Detroit as long as I did, I, I saw this yeah. up close, where you could have a high school diploma and you could Make still a get a middle job. class yeah. uh, uh, life. You can't really do that now. So just because you change the person in the White House doesn't mean that dynamic is going to change. And so that's why, I, yeah, you can tell people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do things differently and I'm going to bring jobs back. Okay, how? But remember, it's right, exactly. people vote the to their interests, just like what he did masterfully in the debate on the Social Security. Look. I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. If you're just joining us, we're talking about politics with the Another View Roundtable. Roger Chesley with the Virginian Pilot, Carol Pretlow with Norfolk State University, community activist Bill Thomas, and journalist, author, and talk show host Will Leviste. Okay, so meanwhile, while the campaign is going on, 
there is still President Obama running the country and there's still the uh, desire or lack of desire by the Senate in order to hold mm-hmm. hearings for a, the next Supreme Court person to, pr- to uh, replace uh, Antonin Scalia. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts says, Senate, just do your job. Let's listen. There's a vacancy on the most important court in America, and the message from Senate Republicans is crystal clear. Forget the Constitution. It doesn't matter who President Obama nominates, because the Republicans will allow no votes on that nominee. They will hold no hearings on that nominee. Their response to one of the most solemn and consequential tasks that our government performs, the confirmation of a Supreme Court justice, will be to pretend that that nominee and President Obama himself simply do not exist, cannot see them, cannot hear them. At the same time that they are blocking all possible Supreme Court nominees, Senate Republicans are in a panic because their party seems to be on the verge of nominating one of two extremists for president. Two candidates who think nothing about attacking the legitimacy of their political opponents and demeaning millions of Americans. Two candidates whose extremism, Republicans worry, will lead their party to defeat in November. Now, these are not separate issues. They are the same issue. If Republican senators want to stand up to extremists running for president, they can start right now by standing up to extremists in the Senate. They can start by doing what they were elected to do right here in the Senate. They can start by doing their jobs. Bill, I see you shaking your head. That's insane. There's no constitutional provision to have nine Supreme Court jurists. And what the the Democrats did the same thing, and Joe Biden was one of the first ones doing the same thing. They had the same issue when they were in charge. The Supreme Court is not the problem. The problem is our children can't find jobs. You look at every poll, the number one issue is is economic (laughs) development and job creation. And for her to demagogue this, and for the 33, and actually would you put Cruz together, that's got to be 65% of the people in the Republican Party that's supporting these extreme idiots. I guess they're stupid and ignorant. No, they're well, not. She is. Uh, well. I, th- I think people need to understand what happens if you have a tie in the Supreme Court. Do people understand what happens? What happens is right, the, nothing. It, what happens no, is the lower court. The, 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 the current law. The remains what it is. Does not make a decision. It right. Make it, a means, good it, thing. it means it, it remains what it is. Do people understand that? As she is saying, this is the Senate's job. People understand that um, this is what the president we we hired him here to do, and we know that underlying this is all about the disrespect and and keeping the president from continue to make an impact Roger. And, and it's also uh if the shoe were on the other foot i i and it feel been. pretty pretty certain that democrats would do the same to Absolutely. republican president as well but it, it shows a lot about the dysfunction the distrust Absolutely. and the the just desire for power among the folks in in the congress uh, you should not have you should not go a whole year and not have a ninth supreme court justice there but, you know, Senator Warren can say all she wants. It's going to fall on deaf ears for, deaf ears for most of the uh, Republicans in the Senate. I, I doubt it's really going to make a difference who President Obama, when he finally does nominate and, and sends a name forward, that the Republicans have made clear they don't care. And they're going to do just exactly what they said they're going to do. They have. Our phones are lit up. Let's go to <laughs> Sandy in Chesapeake. Hi, Sandy. You're on the air. Uh, hi, thank you so much for taking my call today. I, I do enjoy your show very much. Thank you. And just a quick aside, I would like to tell uh, Roger, and I, I don't hear Vivian today, but I I read their articles in the Virginian Pilot. I even cut them out and save them um, to have talking <laughs> points, and I appreciate having the opportunity to listen to them. Oh, Roger. Uh, I, I someone is still reading. <laughs> <laughs> someone still reads the pilot. <laughs> Yes, I know. Exactly. Um, I, I'm really concerned. Um, I always considered myself a uh, an independent, and until January 2009, uh, when President Obama took the took the oath of office 
and we heard the leader of the Republican Party say that the number one job was uh, for his party was not to find jobs for our citizens, uh, not to get our country moving forward, but to be sure that Barack Obama was a one-term president. So I can listen to Bill pontificate all he wants uh, about uh, how he can think of even voting for uh, Donald Trump. The whole idea is that the Republicans have crossed their arms and are holding their breath until there's a Republican in the White House. And I don't know whether it's Bernie Sanders or Secretary Clinton who will be in the White House next January, but are we going to get four more years of that? If there is, there won't be any jobs, there won't be any economy, there won't be clean water, there won't be anything, because that seems to be their number one position. Okay, and Sandy. I will listen to my comments off the air. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you so much for the call. Well, if, uh, let, me think, yeah. <laughs> let me figure out who Trump, to go to first. If Trump go gets ahead. in there, the Republicans are all going to pass out. Cardiac arrest. Bill, what did you think of it since she called you out specifically? Well, she called me out all she wants, and I voted for President Obama, not because he was black. That has a lot to do with it, but he was the best candidate. He was going to get us out of the war, which I wanted to do. He was going to bail us, get us out of this craziness that these uh, one percenters in Wall Street had gotten us into. I don't like the way he did it, but he's where it. the country was getting ready to just ev- evaporate. Mm-hmm. So I give him credit for that. What I, what I am here now is that our country is not safe. Our children are not being educated in these public schools, so they'll never find any kind of jobs. And the violence in our community is just abhorrent. So... Nothing has changed, and nothing has changed for black people because it's not about race anymore. It's about class. Ah, expand on that a little bit. <laughs> anymore? The black folks <laughs> really? that have an education, that were raised in a good family, are doing just fine. Okay. Just fine. Okay, I understand mm. what you're saying. Brian joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Brian. You're on the air. Yes, Barbara. Um, it seems like... The gentleman didn't listen to a word that last caller said. I mean, That's this right. is the party of no. They're, they're not agreeing to anything because they don't want President Obama to to do anything more for this country. You know, it seems like they have amnesia, and they don't remember just what he was handed. Uh, one of the things that I really wanted to bring up, though, is one of the ladies that was talking about Hillary Clinton not being very honest. And another gentleman had said that he checked PolitiFact, I believe, before he went on the air. And if she were to check PolitiFact, she would find that about 70% of everything Donald Trump says is a lie. And uh, for, for her to say that Hillary Clinton is not qualified because she's not very honest, I mean, Donald yeah. Trump will say anything. Okay, let anything. Brian, Brian, <laughs> let me let let me let Carol clarify what she said because I don't believe that she actually stated that that she was not qualified. Uh, but let's let Carol answer. Go ahead, Carol. No, I did not say that she was not qualified because obviously she has been in the Senate, she's been Secretary of State, she's been First Lady, and her background, even while she was in law school, in terms of political involvement, is extensive. What I was saying is that um, she has a reliability issue, and that is we focus in on one thing, and then she changes the dynamics. And to a large extent, she is viewed as untrustworthy. That is what I said. Okay. Uh, Lisa, do we have another line? There we go. Anita from Chesapeake joins us. Hi, Anita. You're in the air. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh-huh. Um, I have two comments. One comment is um, I have not heard uh, either locally or nationally anyone bring up the idea of term limits. We have three-pronged government, and for the last eight years we have been held hostage by the Republicans in the Senate. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that. And the next point is, at what point do you think Donald Trump is going to be able to bring jobs back to America? He is a part of the problem why the jobs are overseas. I'd oh. just like to hear your comment. All right. Thanks so much, Anita. Um, who I wants to on, take I on, think on term limits. Well, I think mm-hmm. your ultimate term limits yes. is to vote somebody <laughs> yeah. out of 
office to, to deal with Congress and how things work a lot of times is that by seniority is where you get on certain committees and you get in position to really have mm -hmm. influence. So if you just put term limits on someone, they really never learn the job. They really never get a sense of what's going on. And what happens is the people who are like in administrative type positions or the lobbyists or people who don't have term limits but have influence mm -hmm. gain even more influence. So your ultimate term limit is to vote somebody out of office. When it comes to jobs and bringing jobs back to America, as Roger was alluding to mm -hmm. earlier, that's a very complex uh, system that's involved that, again, it takes a leader who has to work with several people, businesses, people in Congress, get policies passed and all of that to be able to make that happen. He's he's not emperor. He's not emperor uh, mm -hmm. Trump. Well, I was going to say, so do you think that that's part of the appeal then of Trump, though, because he, kind of, he boils things down right. to... Yeah. Just Basics. the point as opposed to, but behind all of that is a lot of stuff that has to happen. But he's a deal maker. And, and government doesn't create jobs. Government doesn't create jobs. It creates an environment to create jobs. And I would have thought Mr. Trump would have been very, very instrumental in looking at making government more efficient. Congress gets a, all our bills get increased 8% annually. They're talking about saving uh, money from the government. Just cut that off. Zero increases. Our businesses don't get increased 8% automatically every year. So just mm -hmm. cut that out. That's a start. But I think he'll be more in tune with eliminating useless regulations and stimulating stuff. And he's a deal maker. He's going to make jobs work because he understands that nature of things. Okay, I'm going to take one more call on this, and then I want to move on to our next topic. Um, and Elizabeth joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Elizabeth. You're on the air. Yes. Hi. How are you? Okay. Um, I was listening to your program, and I thought about an article that I read today in the Virginian Pilot. It's oh. uh, an op-ed by uh, Andre Oppenheimer, who is a Latin American correspondent for the Miami Herald. Anyway, he's comparing Trump to Hoover. And apparently when Hoover was in, he wanted to do the same thing. Um, he wanted to um, uh, have foreign governments pay more um, import duties okay. for um, things that came into the U.S. And Trump was talking about that last night on the television um, debate. And what happened with Hoover was he um, put in higher tariffs on imports. It was the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, and it raised import duties to record highs. But that led other countries to retaliate, raising their own tariffs on U.S. goods. And the ensuing trade war led to a 66 percent drop in international trade between 1929 and 34, and it led to it was a major cause of the Great Depression. So I don't trust this businessman. He's just out for himself. And um, I would much rather have somebody who knew what they were doing in government than a, than a, um, than a businessman. Anyway, it was in today's paper, and um, I'll let you go. Okay, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Go ahead. She Will. raises a, a very important point, but also undergirds Trump's appeal. Mm -hmm. I remember CNN did something on the businessmen who became presidents and what their records were. Hoover was one. The other one was George Bush. George Bush, the second one, used to be a businessman, oil, also owner of the Texas Rangers. Mm -hmm. Both of them did very poorly, right? So they were making a point that being a businessman does not correlate and equate over to being a politician, right? No, no, no Bill doesn't line, agree with you anymore. But the bottom <laughs> line the bottom line is all of what she just broke down, and when Bill talks about failing education system, the people who are voting for Trump and who have been out of the system and are coming in, they're not processing uh -oh. any of all of what she just said, which mm -hmm. is all true and legit, and that's the appeal. Mm -hmm. That's the appeal. Go ahead, Roger. Hold and, one second. I was going to change topics, but our phones are just lit up, yeah, so we're going to continue. I, I, so I just go ahead, Roger. Two mm -hmm. quick points. One, when you talk about things we get from overseas, things we send overseas, yes, there are these trade imbalances, but a lot of Americans like the cheap products that are made overseas mm -hmm. and then come flooding our way. 
and then you have other countries where we would like to have be more of a player in getting our products in China specifically, and they're not making it easy to do that. I, I don't know that you can have that just because you change the person who sits in the White House, that's necessarily going to change. And the other quick thing I'll mention is at one time we had strong unions in this country. Mm -hmm. And when we had strong unions that also in the uh, the non-union shops, it tended to raise the pay in those shops, too, to try to be a check on what the unions were making. But we're at some of our lowest levels ever in terms of union membership mm -hmm. and that not coincidentally it hurts you you see where some of the pay and salaries are of a lot of americans nowadays so just a couple of quick so it's, it's kind of secular george joins us from elizabeth city hi george you're in the air uh, yes thank you so much for taking my call uh -huh. i uh, want to commend you and your panel for an excellent discussion today thank you um i um uh, was so uh, troubled this week to hear about the violence at the Fayetteville, North Carolina, Trump rally, mm -hmm. and uh, went online uh, and saw the YouTube, um, I think it's if you uh, search for Trump supporter punches. Right, we, we talked yeah. about it a little bit earlier. Uh -huh. And I um, was hoping that your panel uh, could discuss the way in which uh, Trump uh, has incited to uh, publicly uh, people to punch and throw out and abuse okay. uh, peaceful protesters who are uh, just simply exercising their political right to free speech. And also, um, following on other callers' um, idea, which is correct, I believe, that the right's austerity uh, harms the masses and is used by the right uh, and by Trump to set the white majority um, against uh, blacks, and okay. to do so as a red herring or as a scapegoat um, uh, to divert attention away from the right redistribution of wealth to the top 1%. Okay, George, thanks so much for your call, and we'll uh, get a response. Roger, go ahead. The thing that, that is bothersome and is, it is uh, sinister almost is that it's not unusual for protesters to be escorted out of buildings at places like this. It's the, the notion that Punch him, get rid of him. Uh, you know, he would beat this before person he would have been taken out on the stretcher. And and you can see sword. in some of the in some of this, it's giving an excuse to backers of Mr. Trump to maybe some of the things they would think but not say out loud or not act on is now giving an excuse, a, a, a rationale that it's okay. And mm -hmm. that I think is a very dangerous place for us to be in. It, some of that is racial. Some of that is class. Some of that is, uh, you know, different religions. And I, I think there is a fear from a lot of people that Trump is giving folks a reason to act out on some of their basis, on some of their, their, some of Primal their racist. Instincts. Yeah. Yeah. Primal instincts. Instincts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, Will I, and then Bill. I Go think ahead, it's Will. good for America because when Obama became president, all of a sudden we're talking about we're post-racial. All of us sitting right here in this room. <laughs> you know, that's a whole oh, I didn't say that. bunch of oh. foolishness. I yeah. oh, I so <laughs> I think it's good for America because America, one of America's great failings is it's never honestly dealt with all right. of this undercurrent mm -hmm. of racism and hate that still exists. Trump is not out there saying uh, hate this person, hate that person. What happens is people put their own personal uh, feelings and aspirations onto a candidate. Uh I saw that happen. I was in Denver in the stadium when mm -hmm. Obama, covering the, the, the campaign when Obama accepted the nomination. And I was amazed by the people who were crying, who mm -hmm. were putting all of their hopes in that. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, yeah. what is going on oh. with y'all? And maybe it's because I was in Chicago. I saw him. I, I was familiar with him. I had met mm -hmm. him. I saw him lose to Bobby Rush. Mm -hmm. I understood that he was a politician. He's ambitious. He means well. He's trying to do the best for himself and his family. People are putting all kinds of stuff on mm -hmm. him that he never said. And they were in there. I mean, tears. I mean, it was real. I was, like, amazed. I was like, where can I get what he got? Yeah, yeah. it's, am it's amazing how much of uh, we want that person to be the Messiah yeah. until he disagrees with us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bill, go ahead. No, I, I, I think that if all of us were treated equal somewhat to the degree that what Will is saying, that 
I see the violence on our streets more nauseating than some 80-year-old white man punching a black guy walking up irrefutably. I, I just don't understand it. But the I man's arrested. But the point, the point also, yeah, he was arrested the next years day. Old. But he was arrested the next day. And when when does it come that the person who (laughs) has been assaulted (laughs) gets arrested? The more that we keep seeing the absurdity of what happened, the more because that same eighty old eighty old eighty year old guy that Mm -hmm. that sucker punched him, you know, that same mentality is who shot the kid down in Florida because he had had this radio radio uh, channel and and said that, you know, he's not being obedient to me. He's not being subservient to me. What would give a man a right to just like Roger said? <laughs> he's, he's protesting. The caller said he's exercising his constitutional right as a citizen, and he's just gonna he's just gonna sucker punch him. You don't agree? No, no. No. Why? I think, in my entire lifetime, I've never seen this country and our communities in such a state of fear, both black and white. Fear Where of were the you un- in the seventies? <laughs> we, 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 we we fought. We fought against. We did active stuff. We we weren't afraid of it we protested the to, uh, brown versus Seeker board of education was in kansas so we stood up for stuff so people in ferguson didn't protest no no, no oh. what's no, the difference no no because what was going on in ferguson didn't start two years ago or three years ago brown it started 50 years ago and ferguson is a product of that and nothing okay. has really changed in ferguson if you go back and look at the numbers people are still unemployed undereducated, not educated and still making the same complaints to the same people at their local, state, well, and federal civil, level. Okay, and so so juxtapose that. Explain to me then what's the difference between what's going on, what was going on there, and the fact that people hit the streets versus the civil rights. Those people were mm-hmm. rioting for no purpose. Okay. When 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 Martin Luther King wow, and all really? these people that you're talking about, they were quiet rioting. President Obama did a speech uh, over at were. Hampton University. And you ought to go back and look it up. It's called the Quiet Riots. And he methodically goes through this whole thing that we're going through now. Best thing I've ever seen. So so make sure, I, I really want to make sure I'm clear on this, that, that, we're, that we're understanding what you're saying. So you're saying what happened in Ferguson was a riot. Yes. Am I, I'm asking. Oh, absolutely. Versus. I mean, the aftermath of Ferguson. The, versus the hitting the streets and protesting they for civil protesting. rights. They were rioting, shooting at at the arms, the, the police, and doing a whole bunch of other Carol, stuff. Carol, you believe you you agree I, with that? I just I'm astounded that you would say that because I remember I was in the university when at the assassination of Martin Luther King and the riots that broke out, and the fact that even traveling from Nashville to Washington D.C. was problematic because there were hotels now like we're closed because of the, the riots. The riots in '67 and '68 were a riot against hope. Martin Luther were, King was a hope for the future, me, and he was murdered. But they were still riots. I mean, and even before that, there were riots about um, the discrimination among colleges, about events that took place on college campuses, all of that kind of fed into it. So it was not just that we can separate the peaceful events from the calm. Uh, Roger. I, I, I'm not going to say that we, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or, you know, the next day, but we are a resilient nation. In, in Bill's lifetime, I mean, we've gone through World War II, we've gone through the 60s, we've gone through Vietnam, you know, we've we've gone through a lot in this country, and I, I'm surprised that you would make the statement that you know this is the some of the worst uh, things that we we're dealing with is, every, is happening today. Every night and every corner in this community, there's people that are dying on the streets, and it's from fear. Uh, no question, but I don't know that it's fear as much as it is. Uh, just violence and just a uh, uh, no. disrespect for no, for my, fellow people. My history serves me correctly. Right, well. the, one of the worst riots, probably still the worst riot in this nation, was in Brooklyn, like in the 1800s. Yeah, if if you all you can look that up uh, in mm-hmm. terms of p- loss of life, in terms of what they were was riding, that a racial and riot? it was oh yeah, no, it I'm was not, perpetrated. I'm not with it, it was perpetrated by white people. I mean, so when it comes to rioting, you know, the whites in this country. You know, really experts at at rioting in this country. Uh, we get riots, you know, over basketball. And I that's think a riot. Man, I think what happened in Ferguson. The... No, no, let me finish. Let what happened finish. in Ferguson was was very much peaceful. 
protests, and then you had skirmishes that happened around it, but very much they were peaceful protests. Well, we disagree. I thought it was a riot. Still do. Well, go go look it back up. Well, oh, okay. it's on YouTube. It's not like the information's not there. <laughs> whatever go you to see fact on check, TV, go to fact check, whatever you do things on TV and you see <laughs> samples of videos, mm-hmm. that's all constructed too. So I got a right to my opinion, and I thought it was a riot. Okay. And I, okay. I and if people were really interested in changing Ferguson, which they really aren't, the schools are still doing poorly. The kids aren't doing what they should be doing, and so. It's it's a right. quiet riot mm-hmm. that has no end in a cycle. I got about a minute left. I, I would I disagree with you there. Right. There are things that have happened in terms of Black Lives Matter. Not everybody uh, agrees with them, I but they are trying. That. Many members are trying to make changes in individual communities. They're trying to yes, let's stop killing each other. Yes, let's get involved in the political process. Let's bring more African Americans into the voting booths. And these things might not happen all at once, but. Some of the problems that have been germinating for and, and been around here have been around for decades. So it takes time to to fight back against that. Okay. 360 years. All right. Well, with that roundtable, we are out of time. <laughs> 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 I do want to get to next next month, though, Bill, your your point about the amount of, as you call it, lead poisoning, right. which is the amount sure. of shootings and so forth. So we can talk about sure. that Absolutely. coming up. And before we wrap up today's show, let me invite you to attend the Women's Day Services at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Norfolk this coming Sunday, March 13th at 11 a.m. I have the honor of serving as the keynote speaker, so yeah. I'd love to see you there. <laughs> For more information, dial 757-623-1875. And no, I'm not Presbyterian, just, but they asked I me to speak, speak anyway. <laughs> Next yeah, week. You're going to be Hooper if Next, you speak <laughs> You guys. <laughs> Next week, we'll talk with Erin Aubrey Kaplan, author of I Heart Obama. Hear her thoughts on the legacy of the nation's first African-American president. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Carla Johnson answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Make it a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much, Roundtable. Appreciate you. Let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view. <laughs>